recording. All right, we have a presentation. We're here. We're here. You might want to. Okay, go ahead. Here, yeah, this is. Just uh, take a peek at that. See if that's what you want. Or it should be Zoom tomorrow. Yeah, that's right on the edge of the. That'll work. Fail, which is sort of 
this local versus commercial um, aspect of my thesis, but also through um, looking at cheatgrass die-offs as a restoration opportunity. And quickly, I'd like to recognize, um, aside from University of Madden, where we all are here, um, the, I've received some support and funding from the Rocky Mountain Research Station, BLM, Endow, and the Great Basin Landscape Cooperative, Conservation Cooperative. Some long acronyms out here. All right, so I'm first going to kind of just spell out where we're going here. We're not going to mines or ranches. We're, in fact, heading to restoration land, which never shows up on the signs. Um, I'm going to talk about the cheatgrass problem really quickly. Um, most everyone here is aware of that problem, but you've got to keep it in here. Um, and then I'm going to talk about, in the wake of this cheatgrass problem, what, this, what restoration challenges are and some of the knowledge gaps we have with restoration. Um, and then I'll introduce this die-off uh, phenomenon, which people here have heard of some. Um, uh, but I'll try to specify exactly what we're looking at here. And then I'll go into the study um, and explain all of that and hopefully tie it up into a big picture of how this uh, contributes to things on a larger scale. So the cheatgrass problem, uh, cheatgrass is a, as most people know, an introduced annual grass from Europe that's had an incredibly widespread invasion across the um, Intermountain West. Um, these areas in red here are where it's dense, where it's the dominant plant in this Yellow areas are where it might invade to dominant status, and really it's found throughout this entire image. And it's actually the most common vascular plant in the system, or in the Intermountain West. So um, there's a lot of different things that cheatgrass does when it invades, but some of the main things are it, it increases fire frequency um, to a level that native plants aren't really uh, um, able to deal with. And um, through this and other processes, it, it can alter nutrient cycling um, and reduce native diversity and, and reduce these really complex um, multi-species systems into near monocultures of cheatgrass. And all these things kind of play on each other. The more natives you lose, the more you get fired. And so um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty large problem. Um, and restoration in areas where cheatgrass is really uh, present is um, challenging. And there are few effective control options. And some of the reasons, some of the main reasons that there's few control options is one, the, the, the large geographic scale of the invasion. You know, cheatgrass is everywhere. There's always a, um, in most restoration settings, it, um, there's, there's this constant pressure from cheatgrass. Um, there's also this crisis in reactive funding patterns um, that we operate under with restoration in the Great Basin where we don't really get money to restore things until uh, we need to restore them. And, uh, and also that money is not available for very long, so it's a sort of a crisis pattern. I'm not really going to get into that, but uh, that's kind of part of the reason that restoring cheatgrass is challenging, um, restoring areas invaded by cheatgrass. And also, there's poor success of planted materials, so we can get the right materials and, and the, uh, the right people out there to, to get stuff done, but we really have poor success of what the seeds that we throw in the ground. And there's several reasons, um, and these are the two that I like to focus on here, um, that we don't really get a lot of success in the systems. First, um, the Great Basin is a pretty highly variable and resource limited system. So even on, a, even on an average year, there may not be the resources available for a lot of these plants to uh, recruit and grow. Um, and, and often it's, it's not an average year. So trying to time that with the, with the funding and all of that is challenging. But also we have a limited working knowledge in key areas of restoration. And uh, some, of the, some of the largest um, knowledge gaps are the effectiveness of seeding methods, so how to get the seeds into the ground efficiently and in a way that the seeds are actually going to have optimal conditions to grow. Um, and then also the optimal conditions for these species, we don't actually know um, all, in all cases. You know, we've got some species figured out, but especially when you have a mixed seed, a seed mix, it's, it's hard to, to first sort of predict what conditions you're going to give the seeds and then to know what they need. And then um, also there's, we don't really have a clear picture of the importance of seed source. So we have to collect the seed from somewhere and grow it um, and, get, and get more seed and um, where that seed comes from and how far away from the restoration site it was collected. We, we're not, um, we don't have a really clear picture of the importance of that. And that point is what I'm going to expound uh, upon here in my thesis. But before I um, talk about that, we're going to talk a little bit more about how restoration occurs in the Great Basin. Um, so practitioners in the Great Basin are increasingly using native seed, which is a great thing. Uh, that hasn't always been the case, but we're really moving towards native seed. Um, however, the great areas that often need to be restored requires an incredible amount of seed, and you can't just go out and hand collect a lot of these seeds to get that volume. So commercial production is necessary 
to achieve the quantity of seeds needed. And here's a, a field in, in Washington that's growing uh, Poa Secunda, Sandberg's bluegrass, to be used for restoration um, throughout the West. And uh, this commercial production sort of takes a few years to get the seeds to a, a level of this production. And so this sort of limits the available species that we can use. We can't just plant every species that used to be there. So we only have a few that have been to this level. Um, and also that limits the number of sources for those species. So for, within each species, we only have a few varieties. Um, but it's, it's, it's limited due to this uh, sort of production, which is sort of necessary. But to kind of demonstrate maybe why this limitation is a problem, I've plotted uh, the origins of eight of the most common grass um, perennial grass species that are used in restoration. And there's more than eight dots because some of the species have multiple varieties. But I plotted the original collection location for these, these species that we, we plant in the Great Basin. And uh, in case people need a refresher, here's the Great Basin. I sort of just drew this randomly, so if your favorite Great Basin spot is out, I apologize. <laughs> but um, there's a, there's a, when you look at it this way, there's a fact, a pretty strong fact that the majority of the material that we plant in the restoration is non-local, and I'll kind of explain what non-local means in a little bit, but just remember, I mean, there's, there's, there's one cultivar, squirrel tail, that was uh, originally collected from within the Great Basin, and everything else was collected outside. And so does this matter? We, I mean, if we're bringing these seeds from other places, does it matter? And that's what we're going to look into here. But before, uh, to kind of frame that question, it helps to uh, think a little bit about local adaptation of plants. So, Local adaptation is uh, basically when a local genotype outperforms a non-local genotype in the local environment. So imagine a, a simple continent here, there, land with uh, maybe a mountain range or a river in between, and you've got one species growing in both places. And so that it's just it's one species, and you collect seeds from both of those places, and you plant them in two common gardens. And you plant one of the common gardens is in here, one of them is here, and if the plants from here do better than plants from somewhere else in their own conditions, that's local adaptation. So, or it's evidence of local adaptation. And so in this case, it uh, here appears to be locally adapted and, and also uh, from the plants from there do better in their own environment than in someone else's. So this would be a case in which both, both uh, varieties are locally adapted. And so that's, there's various ways you can see local maladaptation and other things, but this is just a, a basic picture of local adaptation. And there's a pretty large literature supporting um, local adaptation in plants, and uh, that it's it's quite common. However, these, the patterns of local adaptation, the size and magnitude of it, um, is pretty variable within and across species, and also throughout um, different parts of the environment. So things like which species are involved, the life histories of those species, um, the demographics that are involved, um, all of this within the ecology with plants interacting with each other and climates and it's, it's a pretty complex um, thing that really can set up local adaptation and it turns out the Great Basin is also a complex place with many species um, and, and, and heterogeneous environments. Here's two examples of uh, this is just average um, July max temperature across parts of the Great Basin you can see that over short distances you can see pretty large changes in um, temperature regimes and there's precipitation um, and, and you could look soils, you could look at topography, um, all sorts of things, but it's a, it's a pretty heterogeneous place, so um, you'd expect some of these patterns of local adaptation to be complex across the region. Um, but it should exist in the Great Basin. However, um, there are very few direct tests for local adaptation. It's, you have had a, um, it's a bit of a production. And, um, however, there are many accounts of phenotypic differences across the region. What I mean by that is when you collect species from different areas, you can grow them in one place and see that they vary in one trait or another. Um, and here's one example, uh, which is from a paper that Susan Meyer did um, in the early 90s. And this is, um, I don't think I have the species on here. I think it's a grass. However, it's the weeks to um, half of the seeds germinating in a common environment. It may have even been in the laboratory. But so this is how long it takes the seeds to germinate. And this is the collection site temperature mean January temperature, and as you can see, the, the temperature at the collection site where the seeds were located, where the seeds were collected from, is really tightly correlated to how, those, when, those, when those seeds are going to germinate. And so we have differences in germination across um, the landscape. And so there's many other papers of people looking at, um, and studies of people looking at this phenotypic differences in plants across the Great Basin. However, 
almost all of them really do not like making pretty figures, and it's just these massive tables of traits and significance. And so I want, I can't really show you any more without boring you, but um, there's 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 a lot of there's a lot of um, research on this. However, so we know that, th that these traits vary across the landscape, but we don't really know the effects of these differences on restoration success. Um, it's, it's pretty infrequently tested. So we can look at a common garden, we can plant plants from all over, uh, you know, one species, different locations, plant them here, grow them up, and say, okay, at this site we know that they have different traits and they respond differently, but um, in terms of just putting those seeds out in an efficient manner on the, on the landscape, we really don't know how those uh, differences are going to mean you know more success or less success or or whatever. So the uh, the effects of this are infrequently test uh, assessed. And if you remember that the majority of our seeds are non-local in the Great Basin, and we wanted to know if it matters where you get the plants from. We know that they're different, but we actually don't know does it matter for restoration. We really don't have a clear picture of of where to get the seeds to make them grow in an area where we're restoring them. Um, so it makes this question, how does seed source affect restoration, a pretty pertinent question to ask. Um, changing gears here, we're going to introduce you to die-offs. Well, I am, I guess no one up here. Um, <laughs> and uh, just what we mean by a die-off. Um, so cheatgrass is an annual plant. It grows every year from seed, and then it dies, and, and it has to reestablish from seed. So it dies off every year. But um, what I mean by a die-off is a stand replacement failure. So. Uh, a near monoculture of cheatgrass that fails to replace itself. So, in you know, in one year you'd have a really thick, this is all cheatgrass here, just really dense cheatgrass, and it, you know, seemingly grows and is healthy and sets seed, and then the next year, no cheatgrass grows, and you just have this this gray litter of the dead cheatgrass from the year before. So that's really what we mean, what I mean when I say a die-off. Um, and more specifically, I mean, you could see cheatgrass failing to replace itself in a drought situation where there's not enough water. Um, so we really, really hone in on these die-offs, trying to find an adjacent, seemingly unaffected living stand of cheatgrass that's right next to it. Um, and this sort of helps us realize that it's not a direct result of drought because, you know, drought pattern wouldn't occur right here, but not there. And so this really helps us sort of um, tease out that it's not a, a drought related. I mean, it could be related to moisture, soil moisture on a, on a smaller level, but it's not that the cheatgrass just didn't get enough water to grow. Um, I'll show you a few pictures of die-offs to kind of help you get your mind around it. This is one in uh, northern Nevada in 2008, and it's really, this one's really continuous, and there's um, nothing, it's not very patchy, but there's still this, this line, and this green here is almost, you know, like ankle knee high cheatgrass thick. And all of this is dead cheatgrass litter from the previous year, and um, this is May, and no, there are very few cheatgrass plants. I mean, maybe four or five across this this area, which is quite large. Um, they're not always this continuous. Some of them have sort of this patchy nature, but again, there's this there's this discrete boundary um, between these unaffected, seemingly unaffected living stands, and so it really um, stands out. Um, there's been a few existing and completed die-off studies that have been fortunate, many of them I've been involved with, fortunately. Um, and from them we've learned that these die-offs are, they've presumably been happening since cheatgrass has been forming monocultures, but um, we've been able to, to really see them um, quite widely from Utah to Nevada all the way up to Washington. And they vary in size from several meter square patches like this. Um, to several kilometers, like the other square kilometers, um, as have been seen in other die-offs in Nevada. Um, and we know that die-offs may recover in the next year, or they may persist. And the reason that they may recover, which by that I mean after a year of showing no growth, then all of a sudden cheatgrass comes back up again, um, is because the, 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 the die-off phenomenon, whatever's causing it, doesn't seem to affect dormant seeds. And here's a, a, a figure. I just kind of pulled out these three sites that were really recent die-offs, and we, we sampled the, the seed bank, and we looked at the number of viable seeds in the year after the die-off, um, or the year that the die-off was present, and we looked in the die-off and control for viable seeds, and we found similar numbers of viable <coughs> seeds, so we know that whatever is affecting cheatgrass is leaving this pool of viable seeds behind, which allows a site like this that's patchy and die-off uh, ridden to return to a pretty solid monoculture the next year. Um, we also have seen a pulse of plant-available uh, nitrogen following die-offs, and um, 
it can be a pretty large pulse on the order of three to eight times higher um, in the die off, you know, right here versus in these areas where it didn't die off. And this is presumably because all this cheatgrass litter that was built up, um, you know, is decomposing as it as it usually would. But there's no um, there's no current growth of plants taking it up, so it sort of builds up in the system. Um, and, and also, there's from the start we sort of thought that perhaps this could be a fungal pathogen um, caused phenomenon, and so. Um, We've kind of kept our eye for fungal evidence, evidence of a fungal cause, and this is a um, from a paper that's about to come out that Susan Meyer um, and a bunch of other people worked on. We we planted a bunch of cheatgrass seeds into die-off soil, and the ones that didn't germinate, uh, they they looked at what seed pathogens were on them, and uh, this this there's a different genera of seed pathogens or fungi in general, and this this Fusarium genus really stood out as causing a lot of mortality. Um, in seeds. And uh, here's a picture of the fungal hyphae of a fusarium sucking the life out of a cheatgrass embryo. And so this work is um, pretty exciting and they're starting to perhaps get a picture of what's causing these die-offs. And there's also a lot of ongoing studies um, that are working with die-offs right now that have yet to be um, fully completed and uh, I'll just kind of paint through some of the some of the ideas here that people are working on. Um, a team from UNR, actually both of them are here today, um, we're looking at can dioxin be remotely detected and perhaps predicted. Um, and in this uh, pretty rough image here, uh, which isn't fresh from their lab yet, but uh, you, you can use spec, you, you, you can use uh, aerial imagery to sort of so show, like in these red areas, where cheatgrass is reduced over one uh, from one year to the next, or where it's increased from one year to the next. And once you can, once you can get a really um, sort of honed in spectral picture of, of what these dots might look like, we may be able to see if they've been occurring in, in areas over and over again, or if they move across the landscape, or um, what their patterns are. Um, as I said before, another team is looking at uh, which pathogens are involved, if in fact pathogens are the cause. Here's a picture of Susan Meyer with her uh, lovely seed <coughs> dry growing. Um, and that's a pretty large team that's working pretty heavily. And sort of to go with that is, you know, if these pathogens are causing this these dioffs aren't all over the place, so there's particular conditions that these dioffs need to occur. So there's a team also from BYU working on uh, sort of what soil and seedbed conditions do you see um, in these dioffs and what might foster this phenomenon. And of course, um, there's some people looking at do dioffs represent a uh, restoration opportunity, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So this is sort of how um, this work fits into the larger picture. So why would you ask this question, do dioffs represent restoration opportunity? Um, well, there are several great reasons to ask this question. Um, a die-off is an absence of cheatgrass growth in a former cheatgrass monoculture. So, um, in the absence of the dominant plant species, there may be more available resources like water and nutrients for plants that you put in there. Um, and there also may be reduced competitive effects because uh, cheatgrass can have pretty large competitive effects on native um, plants, especially in the establishment stage. Um, also, these die-offs, by their nature, at least the ones we find, occur in these heavily invaded systems. And so there's very few or often no native species remaining. And so restoring these areas is um, uh, sort of high priority in terms of, you know, it's lost all of its species. So these are good areas to target for experimental restoration. Um, and also there's this idea that, you know, something killed the cheatgrass or prevented it from coming back. And so there's potential for negative effects on natives as well. And then this die-off in Utah, um, in this, in this die-off area where there's no cheatgrass growing, there were these squirrel tail that were already established that are just, just rocking. They were just growing really well because they had no competition um, and presumably uh, were doing great. And I sort of saw that and was like, wow, I wonder if native species can just sort of survive this. And these have probably survived the die-off because they were already established. It made me wonder, you know, are native seeds, maybe the seeds coming off those plants, are they just dying or are they establishing too? So um, that's kind of why I started asking this question. And so this is the first question of my thesis is, can native species be successfully restored in the recent cheatgrass die-offs? And um, is this establishment related to different seedbed conditions? And I'll talk about those conditions and why we put them in there in a little bit. Um, and the second question, which I talked about first, is do local and non-local materials differ in their performance as restoration material? And are these differences also consistent across um, 
student bed conditions. And also, since we're sticking in the same study, um, we were sort of looking for do local and non-local materials uh, differ in their response to being planted in and out of die-offs. Um, as Beth sort of alluded to, it was a pretty bad year to try to look for cheatgrass die-offs, and despite driving many hundreds of miles across northern Nevada, um, I was only able to find one site for this, um, this thesis, so it's a bit of a case study. Um, however, we studied the snot out of it, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we get a picture here. Um, it was a formerly, it's in northern Nevada, just a little south of Winnemucca, about 40 miles out in northern Buena Vista Valley, and uh, it's a former Wyoming sagebrush dominated site that's uh, completely uh, ex exotic dominated, mostly cheatgrass, there's some tumble mustard and tumbleweed, but cheatgrass is really uh, the main plant out there. It's at uh, 1,300 meters, and it gets about seven and a half inches of rain, at least over the last 10 years. Um, and it's got these deep, fine, sandy loams that, when given enough moisture, are fairly productive. Um, and it's had a history of die-off activity. I first saw some the patchy die-off thing going on in 2008 and uh, had visited several times and not in the exact area where my site is but within a mile or so it's, we've seen some 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 interesting cheatgrass things going on so um, here's an actual picture of the site as I was studying it so I, we built the fence around it to uh, keep the cows out and the antelope from pulling up all of our stuff but uh, this is the this is what I referred to when I heard to the die-off this is this gray area of this is all previous year litter, and this is just after the cheatgrass had turned uh, brown. So this is this, this light brown here is, is current year growth. And so the control is this adjacent area that's really just across this short boundary where the cheatgrass grew really well in the current year, and this is, it didn't grow at all in the current year. So that's kind of a visual. Um, the two species I chose um, were Sandberg's bluegrass and bottlebrush squirrel tail. The reason I chose these two species were they were present near the site. Um, I found them within you know a mile of of the site on similar soils, so I knew that uh, they would probably occur in the area to begin with. Also, they're widely distributed, and maybe um, and as a widely distributed species, are decent candidates to look at this local versus non-local uh, question. They're also pretty commonly used in restoration uh, due to their uses or uh, utilization as forage for wildlife and livestock. But also because there's um, sort of anecdotal, but also decent research, uh, great research that shows that they're they can be pretty competitive with cheatgrass. So they're a pretty good species to try to plant into a cheatgrass infested area. So for each species, I used a, a local collection, which I collected, I hand collected within a mile or two miles of the site, as close as I could, to try to get um, seeds from more than uh, just a few individuals. And um, I also got a uh, the most closely matched commercially available uh, variety. And so for Sandberg's bluegrass, that variety was called Mountain Home, and it comes from southwestern Idaho. And for Squirrel Tail, it was Toe Jam Creek, which was the one cultivar that was available from Nevada. And so, um, and I'll remind you that these, this is where these were collected, but in fact they were grown, the commercial cult the, the varieties were grown in a seed farm in Washington, and they generously donated their seeds to this project. Um, and so these two species and two sources created four seed lots, and all the seed lots were hand sorted um, to try to get seeds that were uh, viable. Um, the six treatments, and these are those seed bed treatments I alluded to earlier, to try to make different conditions for the seeds. Um, there were six, but really it's three three main treatments and unaltered, where we didn't do anything, we just planted them straight into what was there. A litter removal treatment where we raked the litter the cheatgrass litter off the surface of the soil without trying to disturb the soil too much. And then we also used a fungicide application um, to try to protect seeds from potential fungal pathogens. And then each of these three main treatments had a, uh, an unwatered and a watered, where we added um, simulated precipitation, so a modest amount of water, one in three weeks after we planted the seeds using this high-tech um, Ziploc 2x4 situation which worked really well if you're trying to put water on a small site. Um, and so why would we use this fungicide treatment and modify litter and water? Um, I think the, the first reason is that there were other studies going on in the site at the same time, and they were actually looking to trigger the die-off um, event on the plot level. And so using the fungicide, which hopefully show seeds that were um, you know, being attacked by pathogens without the fungicide treatment would be okay without it. Also, modifying litter seems like a good idea, um, anecdotally, from looking at 
some of our previous die-off wanderings. We've seen this one in Utah where before the die-off happened, somebody drove their truck through the, uh, the cheatgrass and crushed down the litter. And where the litter was crushed down, there was less mortality of cheatgrass seeds, or more success anyway. So clearly, litter is mediating some sort of uh, conditions that are important for this die-off to occur. And also, uh, in terms of why we used a water, um, what mediated water is, uh, there's been research here um, looking at all these different pathogen strains that were again pulled off of cheatgrass seeds and the proportion of them that are killed by these pathogens um, under high water stress and low water stress. And under high water stress, these pathogens, um, I think most of these are in that fusarium genus that I mentioned earlier, are a lot more uh, potent. They can kill a lot more seeds under high water stress. So giving different water um, conditions to the seed may help them trigger the die off. But coincidentally, dealing with moisture and water is also a pretty reasonable thing to do if you're trying to look at restoration um, because you know different sites have different moisture levels and different amounts of organic matter. So it worked for both of our studies to, to use these things. Um, the design of my study, this is that fenced site I was showing you. It's about 50 by 70 meters. And half of it was this gray die off. Well, I guess the dark gray is here. Anyway, half of it was a die off and the other half was this area that didn't seem to be affected. And there were 10 blocks throughout the, uh, the site. Each block was made of an array, one in each um, condition. And that array is 24 plots. And there's those 24, again, there's the four seed lots and the six treatments. And each plot, and these were randomly um, organized throughout each block. And uh, within each plot is a four by five array of seeds. And the way we planted seeds was we glued them to, to, to bamboo skewers, which is a lot of fun. And uh, <laughs> it allows you to plant them at a right depth, and it allows you to really uh, follow up with each individual seedling because you can you can see the little seedling coming up right along the, the skewer and you know that it's yours, you know that it's, it's not you know the resident cheatgrass or other seeds that have blown in. So it really allows us to go through every month and see what's alive, see who's alive, see who's not, and um, you can mark them. And it's, it's a lot of work, but it gives you some really clear data. And um, so this ended up with about 10,000 seeds that were glued to toothpicks. Um, so the sort of the, the timeline of this is I planted in October 2012. Um, I added that water one and three weeks after planting to the ones that received watering treatments. And then every month during the active seasons, um, we monitored for how many of the seeds were showing active growth. And in late May of 2013, I also measured seedlings to see what their um, size difference is. And so this gives us the data that I'll be presenting today, which is emergence, which is the, over the whole first season, how many, what percent of the uh, total viable seeds emerged. Um, seedling activity is measured on, on every month, and it's the, the, the percent of total viable seeds showing active growth at the time of monitoring. And then, it, as I said, for, we measured growth, and then we did height, which is essentially longest leaf length, and also the number of leaves. And we also looked at late season vigor, which we just looked at how green the plants were late in May. And um, those that were greener, more, more green late May, we assumed had higher late season vigor because they were still actively growing. Um, the analysis, I won't go into it too much, but it was set up for a full factorial ANOVA. And uh, the main reason I'm showing you this is for these, these codes here. I'll, sh I'll have a few of the letters up. But we had, for our fixed factors, we had condition, die-off, and control, um, C and D. And we had non-local and local seeds and unwatered and water treatment, and then we had the untreated raked and fungicide. And uh, we used block as a random factor. And so the fungicide, I won't be showing you any results from that because we used the fungicide treatment to uh, try to protect seeds from fungal attack, but in fact the fungicide was toxic to the seeds, it seemed. We had lower emergence on the fungicide treated ones throughout the experiment, so we checked it. Um, and before I get into the, uh, the uh, main results, I want to point out that so in the year that we planted, it had been a die-off that, that whole season. There had been no growth here in the die-off and in the control there had been. And in the year that the experiment was going, um, the die-off had recovered, which is fairly common, and I had talked about that earlier. Um, there's these viable seeds that allow it to recover. So during the experiment, cheatgrass had recovered in the, in the die-off, and it was also still growing in the control. Um, and we measured cheatgrass, and um, there was lower density in the die-off, so there were fewer plants had grown in the die-off. So 
sort of fewer plants per um, you know per area, and you can see here um, in the control there was less density of the die-off, but those plants did grow uh, were growing proportionally larger, and so there was actually higher biomass of cheatgrass on the plot level in the die-off and the control. So um, that was what cheatgrass was doing, but. Um, going back to my first question, can native species be successfully restored into die-offs? And does this change across seedbed treatments? Uh, before I show these graphs, this is the graph we'll be looking at um, all day. So I just want to explain it really quickly. This is the, um, the percentage of active seedlings. Um, so this is, if, if it's up here, this is a, every seed was showing active growth. Um, and then these are the different months that we monitored. And so it crosses three years. And my data sort of naturally fall into these three periods. Um, in terms of the patterns, and I'll be referring to them as early season, which is um, you know late fall when seeds are starting to, to green up if they have the right moisture, um, all the way into mid-spring, so that's early season. Late season um, here is pretty much April and May, and together that's the first season. And the second season, um, at this point we have uh, November and February. So those, and um, also there's this weird pattern, not weird, it's really quite cool, um, that may distract you in the real grass, so I just want to show it here in sort of cartoon form. But the, the seeds that we watered, put water on, they germinated in the fall, and they got up to their maximum, you know, uh, their maximum germination a little sooner um, than those that received just the background natural precipitation. And those didn't really germinate until uh, they received precipitation in the spring, in the early spring. And so uh, you'll see this sort of broken out thing in some of the grass, but that's what it's from. And, but generally, they, they sort of came back to the, a similar level um, early in the season. So, all right, so getting into it, uh, we're looking at this by species because the two species did different things. So we're looking at bluegrass here first. Um, in the early part of the season, there were fewer emerged seedlings in the die-off. Um, and the die-off here is these triangles, and the control is these circles. And uh, this is broken apart by water and the watered. And as you can see, the watered, um, the ones that were watered sort of had a little earlier growth but these triangles here, starting as soon as all the seeds had water, there was this pretty clear picture that there were fewer active seedlings in the die-offs than the control. And if you look at the emergence data, so this is for the whole first season, um, fewer, emerge, fewer seedlings emerged in the die-off in the control. However, later in the season, um, we see these lines totally switch, and uh, the, the die-off, which again is these triangles, showing more active growth than, than the control. So there was a lot more seeds that emerged, but most of them died. And although not very many emerged here, the ones that did seemed to survive um, uh, more frequently than those in the control. And again, in late May here is when we measured for growth. So I'm going to show you the growth data. Um, and despite this large advantage in, uh, uh, not a large advantage, but advantage in number of active seedlings, we didn't see a, a terrible um, difference in, in height. However, um, so here's the uh, three measurements. We have number of leaves over there, uh, bluegrass height, and um, the bigger. And so in the die-off, those that were there were had a lot more leaves than the control. Um, in some instances, they were taller. So in the unwatered treatment here um, is where we saw this difference in height. When you watered, it sort of was washed out. Um, and more vigor, so they were a lot greener later in the season. So there's a pretty increased growth and vigor of these bluegrass in the die-off than the control. And then going back here to look at the second season um, survival, there was not a clear picture of die-off or control um, supporting more or less bluegrass. Um, it was it was not uh, a clear picture. However, if you look at um, all these things that I've talked about here for bluegrass, were pretty consistent um, across all my uh, treatments, except for watering treatment, which I, again I said in the early part had that large treatment effect, but it mostly um, washed out. And um, litter removal didn't really change these patterns uh, on the whole, uh, nor did seed, or seed origin. So local and non-local plants seem to be doing the same things in control of die-off. Switching to squirrel tail now, um, we'll just go through that same pattern. Um, again, in the early season, there are fewer seedlings in the die-off than the control. And again, here the die-off is the triangles. And um, in the water treatment, which are these unfilled ones, it was um, 
there was a bit of an interaction. You can see here that the die-off is lower than the control, but not in April. So there's a little bit of watering effect going on, but um, the sort of larger pattern is that fewer seedlings seem to be um, growing. And if you look at uh, emergence data, we also see that the, uh, at least in the watering treatment, controls had a uh, higher emergence. So emergence lacking in the die-off again, which is what we saw for, uh, for bluegrass. Um, in the late season, there were mixed effects with no clear control die-off difference. Um, it's, and remember, in bluegrass, the lines totally switched. But here, um, there were some, some messy things going on. And this is just one of the interactions that we had. There were just a headache full of interactions. So trust me that there were not a lot of patterns through this part of the year. But then we measured. Um, and again, with the measurement, there's this increased growth and vigor in the die-offs. So um, for squirrel tail, there wasn't a super clear picture in the late season that there were more seedlings anywhere, but the seedlings that were in the die-off had significantly more leaves. Um, they were significantly taller. I forgot to point out these uh, letters over the bars. If they have different letters, they're significantly different from other bars with other letters. Um, and again here, the, uh, the die-off has higher or taller plants than the control, and with uh, late season vigor, the die-offs again um, were showing higher vigor. So these plants were doing a lot better in the die-off despite fewer of them um, coming up, which is pretty exciting after having seen fewer of them come up. Um, and in the second season, unlike bluegrass, which didn't really show a pattern, um, second season survival, which was quite low, I will admit, um, but in the die-off here, these triangles, you can see that it's it's coming out um, that more plants are surviving in the second year and coming up showing active growth than the, than the controls where there was uh, pretty much no survival, very low. Um, unfortunately, again, these were consistent. All these, these things I pointed out here were generally consistent across my other factors with um, the exception of watering treatment again as there were some significant interactions. Um, throughout here, uh, but the litter removal didn't seem to modify things much, nor did seed origin. Um, and so to summarize this first part of um, this study, uh, we saw that native species can establish in die-offs. And so the patterns were that in the early season there was uh, generally reduced emergence and fewer active seedlings in the die-off than the control um, for both species. Um, in the late season there was um, in bluegrass, there's a pretty clear transition to more active seedlings in the die-off, but the squirrel tail um, didn't really show that. However, in the second season is when squirrel tail really showed this advantage in the die-off. Um, and bluegrass didn't show a disadvantage, just there were similar um, densities of surviving survival in the die-off and control, despite the fact that fewer came up to begin with. So you always have to weigh it into that, um, that fact. And again, these were not dependent upon seedbed treatments for the most part. Here's, a, here's, here's an example of why these skewers are, are great. There's cheatgrass growing all over, but we know that that's our POA because it's coming up right along. Um, our bluegrass, sorry. Um, and so I had alluded earlier that these dots may be a restoration opportunity because there's more, perhaps more uh, moisture and more nutrients and less competition for these plants. And so um, first thing I'll look at really quickly here was was cheatgrass competition important, which is kind of the biggest thing that people probably think of when you're like, climbing into a die-off, there's no cheatgrass during the year. So, um, as you know, cheatgrass can be pretty intense competition if you're the only native left in the area. Um, but also, if you recall, cheatgrass was growing both in the control and die-off. And so, it was really difficult to look at this. Um, and I'll first be showing you, um, actually I'll show you just a couple correlative results. Um, this is the number of active plants, uh, bluegrass, um, growing in late May. And this is how much biomass of cheatgrass was growing in the plots as well. And so if we were seeing significant uh, competition, we would see that, or uh, we would see that higher cheatgrass biomass results in lower, um, in this case, act, uh, survival of bluegrass. And, and this is just one graph of the many that were generated through this. But in, and we would, so we would see a negative correlation um, and it would be significant if we were seeing really strong competition. However, not a single one of these for biomass. Um, you know, for all the different months, for all the different growth variables, none of them were significantly negative. And in fact, a couple of them were significantly positive, which means there may have been some odd facilitative uh, effects uh, going on or um, other unexplained things. But really, the 
point is we saw no competition with respect to cheatgrass biomass. However, with density, um, and again, these are correlative results that are pretty, um, uh, they weren't, we weren't able to manipulate cheatgrass competition in our experiment, so this is just getting at some um, sort of ideas here. Um, when you looked at density, though, we did see those negative and significant trends that I was saying would indicate uh, competition. And so, you know, as, as there were more cheatgrass plants in the plot, we saw um, a reduction in number of leaves, height, and uh, bigger. And this is for squirrel tail. And for, for bluegrass, it wasn't really this strong. But again, these are not um, terribly strong patterns, but it does show us that um, the less cheatgrass, the less dense cheatgrass in the dios may have played a part in um, allowing for this increased native growth. But again, these, we weren't, this wasn't really a key prong of our experiment, so we weren't able to really say um, exactly how competition was affecting. With respect to, uh, to nutrients, we did um, sample soils, and as has been found in the past with nitrogen, we found a, large, a, a lot more nitrogen in the diet than the control. And I don't want to bore you with more graphs, but it was on the order of uh, um, several fold more nitrate in the die off than the control. And so, again, there may be, and as well as phosphorus. So, this may be also why these plants were able to grow a little bit more in the die off. Um, switch, switching gears here to the other question that I had, which is local and non local differences um, in performance of restoration material. Uh, we're going to go through this graph similarly again, so it shouldn't be too painful here. Um, the early season, there were more local than non-local seedlings for bluegrass. Um, and again, there's this, this watering effect. Um, this, these circles and triangles kind of switch between the other graphs, so um, the, uh, the triangles now are unwatered and the watered are circles. But it makes it easier to look at control or non-local and local because the, they're different by color here. So. The, the, um, the local plants, which are these unfilled circles, are showing pretty strong um, difference in active uh, seedling activity throughout the first season. And again, if we look at uh, emergence, a lot more locals, lo local seed is emerging than non-local seed. In the late season, this trend really stays, stays put uh, with more local than non-local seedlings growing at all of our monitoring points. Um, we just have a pretty strong uh, <coughs> difference there. And again, we measured there in late May. Um, and despite this large difference, not large difference, but a, a, a clear picture of more seedlings, the seedlings didn't vary by growth too much. Um, if we look at uh, the number of leaves, local and non-local plants were essentially had the same number of leaves. And uh, with height, there were not a lot of strong differences. Um, there was a significant interac interaction where only in the die-off did we see a difference in, uh, in height. And in fact, the non-locals seem to be a little taller than the locals. But uh, not a lot of differences in height. Um, but for bigger, which is how late they were, how green they were late in the season, we did see that the local plants were staying greener longer. So there were more of them, and they were staying greener longer, but they weren't actually showing a lot more growth. In the second season, um, this, uh, this pattern essentially continued with higher local survival. Um, and, and, and the first monitoring in the second season in November, we didn't actually see that pattern, but um, the, uh, the non-local plants seemed to be dying at a higher rate than the, the locals, and it came out significant in, in February that there were more local plants surviving than non-local. And these were, in, these were aside from um, that small interaction that I showed you in growth, we really didn't see the difference in this pattern across the die-off and control, which is their condition here. And this watering treatment, again, had some early season effects. And litter removal didn't change this either, so these plants were sort of responding to this despite um, our conditions that we changed. Um, with squirrel tail, this is the simplest graph we have today. I saved it for the end for you. Um, again, non-local and local comparing. There was no early difference in, um, in survival and or in emergence between non-local and local. So they were doing similarly well. However, in the late season, there were more non-local than local seedlings. So the, the non-local started pulling ahead in terms of um, active growth, how many of them were actively growing. We measured growth there, and we see a pretty strong trend of higher growth and bigger for non-local. So number of leaves, non-local had significantly more leaves. 
They were also, it's the right bar, these two pairs, um, they were also taller than local seedlings and it, they had more vigor. So non-local seedlings clearly doing a bit better here. However, in the second season, there was really low survival for both. Um, we saw that in the previous slides and, and actually there was very little, there were very few differences and also just such, such low survival that um, we can't really make too many strong claims. However, in one of the significant interactions where we broke it apart by control and die off, we saw them doing different things. Um, and in fact, in the die off, which are these triangles, the locals had a small, I mean, this is very small, obviously, but it, it, they were showing some signs of having higher survival in the second season than the non local. And this is kind of weird because the non local were really showing clear advantages. They had more plants, they had higher growth. But in the second season, um, there's, there's a hint that local seems to be doing well, but again, it's quite low survival. And these, these things I've talked about here, again, were consistent through most of uh, my treatments, except for that condition uh, interaction I showed you at the end. Um, to summarize this, uh, seed origin affects performance, is what we found here. Um, however, well, and for bluegrass, there was higher emergence, survival, and vigor of local plants, but there was few differences in growth. So there were more of them surviving, but they weren't really showing this uh, increased growth in the first season. But for squirrel tail, we saw sort of the opposite in several ways. First is that actually the non-local was doing better than the local. And secondly, there was more growth and vigor for the non-local, but fewer differences in emergence and survival. So um, really different patterns between these two species, which I think is great. I only chose two species. I was wondering if I'd see anything exciting, but I happened to choose two that were doing different things, which I guess is good and bad in terms of racking your brain over this. Um, so seed origin affects performance, and maybe some people may be thinking, you know, given all this stuff that I talked about earlier with local adaptation, how could non-local plants be more highly adapted or showing more advantages in, in outside of their original range? Um, so as I said, you know, local plants are likely adapted to the site's um, historic conditions. But often, and so that's why we might see locals doing better than non-locals. However, current environments may differ from historic conditions, um, especially in the Great Basin where cheatgrass has invaded a lot of areas. So um, certain parts of the environment have changed, and if those parts of the environment were what the species were adapted to, then perhaps um, this could reduce the advantage of local plants and provide, um, you know, plants from other where may be more adapted now because conditions have changed. But sometimes, even though on the surface conditions change, you know, maybe species are, are more adapted to, say, the climate instead of what's growing around them. So it's a complex picture of whether local or non-local plants are going to be most likely adapted. Um, so to summarize, native species established in a recent die-off, we saw this um, less emergence, uh, but higher growth and vigor. And I will mention that this less emergence that we saw, we've, uh, I have no idea what's causing that. And we, are, we do have some of the native seeds that died being cultured for fungi. And, um, but again, I really have no idea why there were fewer emerging um, in the die-off. But we did see higher growth and vigor. Um, especially the squirrel tail um, for these um, in the die-off. And uh, similar or increased second year survival. And as well, the die-off effect didn't seem to be too dependent upon seed, seed bed treatments, which is exciting for me because I only have one site and if these things really vary by the litter and the moisture, it would really show that perhaps it's not a transferable thing. But the fact that we saw this pattern despite modifying some potentially significant parts of the seabed. We saw this effect. It might mean that there's uh, this effect may be seen in other die-offs, but only more studies will reveal that. Um, and again, the seed origin, we did see it affecting native performance. And, um, but we saw examples of both local and non-local advantages. And these patterns of um, different performance varied by species and potentially through time. So seed source is important, so what? Um, this result that different sources yield different results sort of bolsters the importance of a lot of current research that's going on. Um, people here probably plant gardens, and you see on the back of your seed uh, thing, there's like this provisional seed hardiness zones or whatever that says, you know, in general, you can move seeds across here without having to worry about when they get planted or any of that. Um, but there's a lot of research now looking at making species-specific seed transfer zones. So 
looking at different species and saying, okay, say taper tip onion, Indian rice grass, blue bunch of rice grass, let's collect a bunch of seeds from all over, grow them together, see how they respond, and try to group them together to see that, yeah, plants collected from here are similar to those from here um, in terms of the factors that they're experiencing. So there's a lot of this work going on. And the fact that I found different sources yield different results for different species really bolsters that this is um, important work that is is happening and it should continue so we can really get a species specific idea of, of where you can move seeds and this sort of research also improves our source diversity for native species and restoration whereas we can really define these areas and then collect seed from the different zones in this case different colors uh, as restoration material to grow then we'll have um, some likely um, successful material wherever we need to use it. Um, also this result that local or non-local may perform well um, kind of provides impetus to sort of move away from this local and non-local debate which um, some of you may or may not be familiar with. There's been a bit of a debate um, like a lot between restorationists and people who are really just on the ground uh, all the time and this debate is sort of sizzling away already but um, this sort of helps say that, you know, local or non-local maybe isn't the question to ask. Instead, we should be focusing on linking restoration to, uh, success to the traits and strategies that plants are or that plants are using to, um, to establish. Um, and so um, putting this diop supporting na seeded natives into its perspective, um, as I said before, establishing natives into highly invaded systems is difficult and low establishment is um, a key limitation often. So the fact that DIOS may improve establishment um, sort of warrants more uh, larger scale investigations into this DIOS because if, if we can actually dependably have an area where plants are going to do better in a restoration um, situation, that's always good news. Um, so we should be looking into this uh, on a larger picture. Which brings me here. Um, to the continuing questions that this study and other studies are addressing. Um, so what are the long-term survival outcomes? We only, I only looked at plants over the one season, beginning of the second season, um, and this really isn't enough to know if the differences that we're seeing are really going to matter on the ground. And so uh, looking at them through more years and doing second year measurements and seeing if they're even producing viable seeds, that's important for both the die-off and um, uh, no, local, non-local aspect of this. We just You really need to monitor for more than a little bit. Um, also, as I said, there's only one site, and so we really need to look in the future at are these results similar to other die-off sites. I was actually uh, messing around on Google Maps the other day and found my field site on Google Maps, which means that you need to graduate because it's here on the internet. <laughs> um, but that's one small piece of a, of a larger picture. So it, um, finding more die-offs, and it's not the easiest thing. You can't just get money and go find die-offs, um, but uh, having more sites in the future is um, crucial. And also, will these results that we see be similar using common restoration methods? And as you know, so we, we glued these seeds, toothpicks, and planted them and bent over every month to like find them, and that's not something that happens in restoration. Restoration throws seeds out on the ground um, and uh, tries to get them in the right plots, spots, but it's a lot more um, efficient than what we did. And what we did, we needed to find these, these really um, uh, detailed results. However, using common restoration methods is going to help us in these future die-offs. It's really going to help us see if these patterns that I've just described to you today are actually relevant on the ground. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank these three people, and I'll take questions. I'm just kidding. Um, there's a lot of people that helped with this. Um, the, um, I'm not going to read everybody's names, but I'll sort of go through it. Um, committee and uh, collaborators really helped guide this on the, on the large level. Um, work, you and our workforces are all volunteers, essentially. Actually, no, these are paid and unpaid people who are out there doing the seeding and, and, and watering treatments and all of that. Um, there are some people who just volunteered to help build fences and... Uh, when I came into the office and said, I cannot get this done, what are you doing tomorrow? Um, BLM really helped out a lot in terms of getting the fence set up and uh, providing us with information, and DIOS uh, provided, provided funding. Um, and even my dad was out there sticking seeds into the ground in the cold. Um, and people at BYU helped set up the site as well. And again, I said, uh, the seed company donated our, our materials. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank my real family and the Ledger Lab family and my friend family for helping get me through this three years. Um, so with that, 
for the questions. So am I, 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 am I correct in thinking that that second year, all the changes, right, and the decreased survival and lots mm -hmm. of stuff in that second year are from the increase in cheatgrass that came in that, in that, uh, rest in that non die off? Right. Um, so we did look at this competition in another way. I showed you those really rough correlated results. We also put the cheatgrass uh, biomass and density in as covariates yeah. um, for late season and second season results. And we found very, very few um, things that would suggest competition was important. And, and as I said, when you included it, it seemed to sometimes support the idea that where there was more cheatgrass, there was more natives as well. So they may have been both responding to something else. But, but the, the lowest survival that we saw in the second year is probably due to the fact that you know plants make tons of seeds and uh, very few of them ever survive. So that's a fairly normal curve to see um, but yeah, we didn't really get a lot of pictures that it was from competition directly. But again, we didn't manipulate it in this study. We had enough factors, but I really would have liked to do that. But. Really interesting results. Um, I did want to note that the Great Basin Plant Project, mm -hmm. a native plant project as they've been renamed, yeah. has been a concerted effort to make collections of native species yeah. across the entire Great Basin, and that they also have looked at comparing the species for performance as well as trying to determine restoration methods. Yeah. So I think that's that's important context in terms of mm -hmm. um, local versus commercial sources. Yeah. Um, and then I have a question for you, which is, um, why do you think you didn't have any significant results with litter removal? Yeah, that we, we, we put that in there, experience, hoping to have um, some differences, and it's Bizarre that it didn't really play out too much. Um, we did see some um, small interactions that it would sort of reduce plant height, um, but nothing for these two questions that I addressed. But it did somewhat affect things here and there when you just looked at litter removal. But um, yeah, in these die-offs, it's a it's a pretty significant layer of litter. It seemed like it would affect survival, but we didn't um, we didn't see a lot of big pictures. And I don't know why that is. Um, there were some people studying um, Zach Andrew in the same site. They had sensors and probes all over, looking at when you remove litter, does it change, or how does it change temperature, how does it change moisture availability? And so, looking at his results will be really interesting to see. You know, did litter removal really change a lot of conditions for the seeds? And then you can begin to ask that question: It's like, why, why didn't they respond, or why didn't they respond in the way they did? So, yeah. Do you think, do you think seed burial had something to do with that? All the seeds were at the same depth. Um, which is about a centimeter and a half, two centimeters down. Um, so, no, I don't, I mean, presumably litter would affect conditions at that level, but it would be a little less than if seeds were right on the soil surface, so, yeah. Yes, what I'm hinting at is that perhaps the fact that you buried them and naturally they would be on the surface. Right, right. It might have made a bit of a difference. For sure, I'm sure it would have. Um, I think the reason we planted it down is because sort of the, the, the the information that's coming from these, these studies that you mentioned doing, um, seeding methods, sort of show that a little bit more burial can help them a little Absolutely. bit. So that's why we kind of stuck them at the depth we did. But so many things you want to you want to change, you know, have different seed depths and all that, but it gets complicated. I was wondering if you could speculate on the effect of uh, litter removal on cheatgrass growth. Do you think that it has? Any effect at all? Did the cheatgrass grow taller? It did. So raking off the litter removed a lot of the seeds, um, and so we saw a pretty big difference in um, of density and biomass of, of plants in the raked plots, and so that really confounded things. But um, in terms of its actual growth, once it's been raked, um, you know, I, I imagine it would be the same factors that are affecting the native plants. Um, you know, there'd be the less insulation and all of that, but. Um, but we did see a direct result of raking, and it was pretty strong because we were just getting the litter, but a lot of the seeds are caught up in the litter. So, but it didn't get all of them. You know, I mean, there's still a lot of cheatgrass growing even where we raked. So, um, prolific seeds there. But I don't know if that answers it. I was just wondering if the remaining plants would have ended up growing taller because that they wouldn't have any uh, competitors. Yeah. They have to worry about coming up emerging through the litter. Yeah, I do have that data. I haven't put it in here, and I'm not really keen on it right now, but. Um, we, we can't look at that for sure. 
So I'm really interested in the differences between the local and the non-local. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if if they know whether or not whichever one does best is because it's a better genotype, or if perhaps there's just higher genotype diversity and you have more options to find the right combination of things. Yeah, and yeah, and that's that's like a big unknown. I mean, there's so many unknowns in terms of uh, restoration um, in the Great Basin. That's one of them. It's like, you know, plants that grow well in the first season may not actually be the best ones. Um, and, you know, I collected from as many plants as I could, but perhaps the populations I was collecting from were sort of bottlenecked in, um, in that sense. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to do that um, on a larger scale, plant them all and really get at those um, genetic bases you can, but with these two species, I don't have that information. But it's a it's a it's a huge concern, you know. The patterns that you're seeing, um, and Beth has seen in some of hers that the plants that grow well, that have been dropped out of a you know a BLM cedar or something, they grow really well and they seem to be making seeds, but like very few of the seeds are even viable. So, I mean, you really don't have a picture of performance until you look at the long term. So, but the genetics is a huge part of it, um, for sure, especially with remnant populations. But. <coughs> Um, where did you get the local seeds? Where did you acquire them relatively? I think you helped me collect some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question though. Uh, there's a lot of trips out to Dunglin, so it's easy to forget about some of them. I collected them within as close as I could, um, finding populations that were close by. So um, the poa came, a, the bluegrass came a little farther from the site than the squirrel tail. The squirrel tail was actually on the same bench and the poet was just around the corner, about three miles away. But Your die-off area had a pretty good recovery um, in the year plant. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that you would really want to try, if it was possible, to find, to predict it, be able to predict the die-off area in something like November. Yeah. Can you really foresee being able to do that in any way? Yeah, that's what we're hoping some of this spatial um, work I might mean, tell well, us. Spatial is going to rely on... That's the only way, though. Up. No, I, I agree, but I mean, in terms of patterns, if the die are occurring in areas over and over again, then we may be able to say that it might happen here again. But no, to directly answer that, it's really hard to see these die-offs until, until there's enough growth to say, like, yes, g is doing well there and it's not here. And sometimes yeah. that's and it, apparently. Like, I mean, some of the data, it looks pretty complete, and others are, are not quite as yeah. complete. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I totally see that, that wanting to ask the restoration question in that type of area, I mean, right. it's, uh, very probably is a, is a great opportunity, but, is, you know, is, is there any. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these, these die-offs that we see are the very obvious ones, and, you know, presumably they're happening in areas where there's maybe still more shrubs and other plants, and you can't actually even see that the die-off's happening, even though potentially cheatgrass could be dying out there. So, yeah, we really sort of selected a piece of, like a narrow piece of these die-offs to look at in the study where you've got sort of larger areas. But, yeah, I mean, I think more, more studies and, and maybe finding patterns in these die-offs can help us answer that. Peter? Just to follow up on yeah. that, these die-offs, like at Dung Glen, you pick Dung Glen because it's a place where there's die-off that occurs even in an otherwise favorable year. So it's a certain kind of die-off. Right. We're not calling die-off the die-off that occurs for cheatgrass and many annual species in every really dry year. Like this year, there's cheatgrass die-off everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not calling it that. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, we can go to, we can go to we go out on the landscape, we see places with more favorable water balance, deeper soil, the cheatgrass is coming in. Sometimes there's a sharp boundary due to site environment, and there's another place where the cheatgrass isn't coming in. We're not calling that die-off either. So we're calling certain places die-off because we're inferring a kind of causal mechanism that's disassociated from site environment, from, from annual precip, from water availability. So it's a certain kind of die-off. Can we predict where that occurs? I think it's going to be a bit like the stock market. I mean, it's like <laughs> historical performance for a given company, in this case a given place, and try to infer something about the future, but it's so multi-causal um, that I think it's going to be difficult. But I guess that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, it seems like it's been a difficult journey. 
the good news is a lot of the work you guys are doing is really helping us get a picture of what cheatgrass looks like in terms of its spectral thing, which is useful for other reasons. Well, but that's not to get a die-off again. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Inferring something about mechanism. Mm -hmm. More questions? You're first. Um, can you find, like, looking forward, how do you, how do you apply this to, you know, larger restoration? You know, because the, the, the planting is in a different way. Right, you know, yeah. Yeah, the next step would be to just try this in multiple sites and perhaps use on a small scale some common seeding methods. Um, like if we found a die off, we could get a drill out there and, and go through it and set up a couple um, you know, trials in different places. But yeah, there's not a direct line into like how we're gonna restore this area. It's just this um, sort of clear and detailed picture of what's happening on on a really fine scale is just going to sort of support the idea that maybe we should look at this on a on a larger scale. So I think it'll be a multi-step process to really directly affecting things, but more sites is, I'd say, the, the direct answer to that, to just see if, because I mean, I picked two species, they did different things, if I pick two die-offs, they might do two different things as well, so. But some of the effects, like this nitrogen uh, pulse, seems to be a common thing across die-offs, so. The more studies we do, even if they're only single site studies, can start to support this idea that there's perhaps a predictable response of natives there, but not uh, it's such such a big steps, unfortunately. <laughs> Tara, did you want to ask a question? Yes. Oh, I don't know. This is like a wild guess, but it seems like the, the thing you really want to know is if the local versus the model is are leaving more viable seeds on the site, and you can't measure that in the time frame that you have right. for a perennial plant. Right, so we have we're gonna we have plans to go out there and, and uh, to do that. Uh, they're actually uh, I was out there just a couple weeks ago, and a lot of the, the plant natives that we planted are flowering. So I think we're gonna try to collect seeds um, from at least a group of them and, and see what's going on and measure them again. And actually, that our site's allowed to be there for five years, so hopefully it won't take too much time in the future to go back out there and yeah, get a good picture to see if uh, uh, it's really affecting. If yeah, if those patterns are really playing into fitness versus just like how big they are or whatever, so that's going to be an important picture of the story for sure. Well, Anybody thanks. Else? And right. um, just if you have more questions for Owen, you can come over and grill them at our house tonight. <laughs> uh, we're going to celebrate with pizza and beer at about five thirty. I'll write my address up um, on the board. Uh, so let's thank Owen one more time. And thank you guys for. Monday at nine. Grab some more stuff on your way out. You fit a lot of keys in your pockets. So. Okay.